So today I would like to start my talk. It's not going to be an hour long, um, so you don't have to listen to me for an hour. We can all run away and get a drink afterwards because I'm going to need one. Um, so um, I'd like to start my story by um, telling you about a girl. And this little girl, um, a long, long time ago in the 1980s, uh, she had her very first year of school, finished the year, ran across the playground with a brown envelope in her hand. And this brown envelope was her school report. She gave it to her mum and asked her to read it to her there and then. In this envelope, it said um, she is a bold student who is bright and bubbly. She uh, is a pleasure to teach in the classroom. Uh, she is willing to help all the other students. Um, a really great student. And this girl went through school and university with the same kind of report every single year. She never really had any problems with bullying. She never um, felt alone or, or um, upset by people. She was very much a social butterfly. Um, she loved going on holiday with her family and extended family and would be willing to help anyone and everyone whenever she could. When she was 22, she met a boy and he promised her the world and they fell in love and he asked her to marry her, um, her to him about when she was about 23 and they moved in together. So everything happened a bit quickly. And it wasn't long after that when he started to take control of their finances, which kind of makes sense. Somebody has to kind of pay the bills. But then he started to take loans out in her name and then he started to tell her who she could see and what she could where and if she should see her family or not and then it got to the stage where it was what she could eat and what she could watch on the tv and the food that she ate and he was she was beginning to feel a little bit enclosed in a poisonous bubble and the only time that she had to herself was the mile it took to walk to work every morning and in this um 10 minute walk she would be f her face would be full of tears she'd feel lonely she'd be upset there were times when she crossed the railway bridge that actually she considered jumping in front of the train but she was never going to she would never want to hurt another person but that was the position that he had put her in she was the bottom of the bottom and she was feeling pretty terrified and lonely and she never felt like she could hold her head high or be very, very enthusiastic. She definitely wasn't the girl that she grew up to be. And um, when she was at work, she would talk to some people online and these people would make her laugh and she'd make them laugh. And she was, she kind of had that little bit of happiness for like a few hours just talking to these people. And one day when she was around 27, they told her that, say, that, that she should go to this big conference and it would really help her career and she, it would, like, they could see that she had some potential and that she should go along. So her reply was, no, he won't let me go. There's men there. There's this there. And, and all of these people turned around and said, no, that's not right. You have to come. And it took a little while because this was the beginning of the year and the conference wasn't until the end of the year. But she finally kind of realised that, yes, she wanted to go, but she still needed to figure out how she was going to do this. And one day, when her partner went to work, she did the bravest thing that she ever did, and that was that she left him. And she went to the conference. She got a good job in a pretty good, design, in a good, pretty good agency. She's also stood here right now talking to you. Um, and today, I would like to tell you how I kind of got myself back together again and how I became me again. Um, so the first thing I did is you might have realised that the conference that I wanted to go to is DrupalCon. It was DrupalCon London and the people that pushed me is actually this row of people here <laughs> which is really terrifying. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. <laughs> I'd like to say, first of all, thank you to these people here for doing that. 
they didn't really know what they were saying. They didn't really know how much of an impact it was having on my life when they said that. Don't cry. <laughs> but it, it, it meant the world. Um, and so these are my tribe. And there's other people that are in my tribe that can't be here today. And there's other people that aren't even Drupal people that are in my tribe. But I recommend everybody to find your tribe members. Um, they are, are like the key people to push you into being the best version of you that you possibly can be. And they'll do it even if you don't want them to. Um, they, they'll do it and they'll be your cheerleaders. They'll be your conscience. They'll be your mind. They'll, they'll be there for you. And um, you probably don't even recognize that you've got the tribe out there because we all take people for granted really easily. And it, I think maybe over like the next few days, actually spend some time to think about who is in your tribe. It doesn't have to be your parents or your wife or your husband. It doesn't have to be these people. It can be somebody that you don't even know. Um, one of my tribe members is actually Gavin Strange. He's um, a senior developer in Ardman. And the reason he's in my tribe and that I follow and admire him on every single social media thing there is, is because I really love his vibe and I love the way he works and his passion and his energy. And I want to take a bit of that. And I think that you, we've all got these people that we admire and that you can pull things from them. And there's the saying that if you surround yourself with six people that you'll become elements of those six people. And I think that's very true. And I think that if you are acknowledging who you're spending your time with, acknowledging your tribe, then that will give you a massive head start into where you want to go next. Um, when I left my ex, I was probably more scared when I left than I was when I was there. And that was because all of a sudden I had to use my own mind. And these people, they... They kind of told me what to do when I didn't know what I was doing. And the first thing they, I asked them was, what do I do now? And we made a plan. And actually, this plan, and you might see me walking around with this, is, um, is this. Um, and this was on my bedroom door. And I need to get back down for the microphone. Um, this was on my bedroom door for a long time, and it had very menial things in, like write my CV, buy a car, and go to DrupalCon. And DrupalCon was the very first thing I managed to cross off this list, actually. And somewhere down here, it says talk at DrupalCon. So I probably should cross that off. Um, but this list helped me put some focus back into my life. It helped me do things that I maybe wasn't going to do or that I thought I couldn't do. It says run a marathon. I ran a marathon. It says skydiving. I met a guy and said, oh, yeah, I've got skydiving on my list. I'm going to do a tandem. And he was like, nah, you do your uh, AFF level one and you'll just pull your own cord. And I'm like, yeah, funny. So I did that. Um, <laughs> and, um, and this is the thing. Like, y these people just come, they push you, and they help you. And there's things on here that I don't quite understand what they are, but somebody told me to do it, and I trust them, whatever. Um, and that really helped. Um, there came to a stage when I stopped using this bucket list and I started feeling a bit better with myself and I got on with life. Um, and I needed smaller lists to get on with tasks and daily things in life. And what I found was um, a bullet journal. And this bullet journal is like the simplest kind of notebook there is. So there's all these fancy trackers to do things like to do and and Trello and all these like tracky list things. But the bullet journal I found was really helpful because it's basically the potato of the notebook world. <laughs> and what I mean by that, bear with me, what I mean by that is that a potato is like the most versatile thing there is in the kitchen pantry. You can turn it into chips, you can turn it into waffles, you can turn it into roast potatoes. Anybody else hungry yet? <laughs> and, and, it, and it is very versatile and you can make it into what you want it to be. And this is the same with the bullet journal. It's just a plain notebook. And it's just got some very simple rules of check boxes and an index and some other simple tasks to follow. But the point is, is you make your own trackers. I've got a tracker in here for the amount of days that I've run. I'll, it's just a blank page and 
I just, <laughs> it is still a blank page. And, <laughs> and, and the, I just like draw little pictures of footsteps in it for every day. And then the plan was that the biggest, the loads amount of footsteps on there would be that I run a lot. Yeah, there's about three or four. And, um, and then there's another one for my mood and things like that. But I also use it as an actual journal and I write and write and write in there. And some days I write in there and then I don't read it back. And another wonderful tip I found pretty early on was that when things get really stressful, just to write and write and write and let it out. And that cathartic kind of letting everything out dump of stuff helps for that moment, but it doesn't fix anything. And the way to fix it is to go back after writing a few of these and to weed it down and to find the elements of what you've written and to go, OK, so I moaned about work there and I moaned about work there. I think there might be a problem with work. And then, and then you can figure it out, and then you can slowly go through. Because it's all about reflection and going back and finding the things that, that maybe at the, that present moment aren't a problem, or they don't seem to be a problem, but you just when you're automatically writing them out, it just falls out. Um, so ever since I left my ex, it hasn't all been roses. Um, it was five or six years ago. Um, but two years ago, I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And that kind of flew everything up in the air again because I thought I was going to get my life back and I was going to do all these wonderful things and then health got in my way. Um, so I had to kind of first look at what Crohn's was. I had no idea. Um, I, I knew that it was painful because I'd suffered with it for quite some time and I knew it was something to do with my digestive system. And the, that was it. And um, so I had to start researching into it. And one of the key factors that I kept on cropping up was that stress played a massive part in um, the flare-ups of what Crohn's does. So I started to read about how to control stress because the nurses were saying to me, we're going to give you these crazy drugs. They're cancer drugs. They're going to lower your immune system. You can't go near anybody who's sick. You can't do this. You can't do that. And um, don't drink any alcohol. <laughs> it wasn't going to happen. I'm not taking those drugs. Um, so I had to learn how to manage my stress because I wanted to be able to live my life to its fullest. Because honestly, I missed out five years of it by being with the world's worst demon. So I needed to get that back and I needed to make sure that I wasn't going to suffer again. So I started to read about stress. And one book I very much recommend is Dr. Steve Peters' um, The Chimp Paradox. And this book, I've been given other books to read, but this one is written in a style that I really understood, and it was really helpful. It's all about monkeys, weirdly. And it, um, it's basically how you've got a small monkey in your brain, and it's like the child that's naughty, and it, it's the thing that reacts first. And it's all about controlling this. And it's all about sorting out how to to kind of control the naughtiness and to be you properly. And I really recommend that, and it really works quite well. And um, that kind of pushed me a little bit further into wanting to read more. I haven't actually finished this book, <laughs> and I've given this talk quite a lot of time. But um, the point is, you started reading it, and then you go in the footnotes, and then you want to read another book, and then you read another book, because that bit's interesting, and another bit's interesting. We've all done it. We do the same every day when we're Googling for why this problem is. We end up like looking at cats, because <laughs> all of a sudden, one thing was similar. Um, so the other thing I recommend is Blinkist. And um, this really helped me get back to being able to read the chimp book again, because it's just, uh, there's another other services like it, but Blinkist was really good because it gives you like the top 10 of something, and the, um, their facts, they've read the book for you. They're just going to digest it down and tell you it. And I have never read so many books in my life. Um, before I had Blinkist, I think I probably read the Harry Potter books. And this, I now have read like 47 books in just like six months. That, you know, that was great. Um, and it's been really helpful. You can just pick things up. You can go into it. If you want to buy the book, you can go through and buy it in even more. Um, so... They were really helpful tools for helping me figure out what stress is. Um, I really needed to understand the cause of the problem and fix the root of it instead of um, just 
sticky taping it over. It's the same with code. You don't just stick an important somewhere. You have to get in and fix the root of it, or you should be doing that. Um, so I, knowing that I needed to reduce the stress in my life, I decided that I was going to do some meditation. And I picked Headspace, the app, and that has actually been really useful for me. Um, and it, it kind of, it's not meditation like you expect it to be. I think a lot of people might know this app. It seems to be getting more and more popular. But um, it, I always thought meditation was going to be imagining myself in a white dress on a horse floating through the fields and then going off to some zen land somewhere. Well, it's not like that. You don't really have to float anywhere. It's just imagining maybe a warm light or something and just being mindful of your body. And that became really important with Crohn's disease because I have to be very aware <coughs> that at some point I could get very sick. And I've learned that if my elbow starts to hurt, then maybe I need some time off work because I'm about to get inflamed and puffy and get really tired and stressed. And it's kind of like a trigger that I'm getting stressed. And the only reason I found out that my elbow is the first place to get inflamed was because of this meditation. Because I'd sit there every day and I'd give myself 10 minutes. And how many people sit there and pay attention to themselves for 10 minutes? You don't. You just carry on with everything else in your life and you never stop and think about you <coughs> from head to toe. And that's really important. And not just for physical illnesses, but mentally as well. Because that 10 minutes of standing still thinking about nothing other than how you feel puts everything into perspective and can help you carry on and get further. Um, so I didn't realize, actually, until I did most of the sessions in this app, that I was doing some of these things naturally um, when I was with my ex. Um, when I was walking towards the train crossing some days, I'd look down at the floor because in those days, I would literally walk with my head down, very timid, very unable to talk to lots of people. And I would see a puddle on the floor, some rubbish, the grey pavement, and it would just be a, it's a very depressing picture. And I would keep walking with my head down, and I'd feel worse and worse and worse. But some days, typically around spring or on a sunny day, I'd be able to hold my head up and see that actually there were rows of blossom trees, there was a bright blue sky, and instantly my mood is lifted. Everybody feels better on a sunny day. Everybody feels a little bit happier when the sun's out. And what the mindfulness app actually taught me is that that sunshine is always there, even if it is rubbish at some part. There is some sunshine somewhere. I imagine quite a few people came here on a plane. Um, you all went through the clouds and came up the other side and the sunshine's there, the blue sky is there. Um, and that's the thing, it could be miserable. I was hoping it was gonna rain and be typical Dublin weather, but it's not. Um, but <laughs> you can't have everything. Um, but um, and I, yeah, the sunshine, is, it's still there, it's still the other side of the clouds. And that's the thing, when I was in my very bad poisonous bubble, I still did have that sunshine and that was my tribe of people that I spoke to on the internet in the days. So there is something there, and even when you do feel at your utmost worst, I think taking those five, ten minutes to look into yourself and to try and identify that blue sky moment makes a massive difference. Um, and I'll move the slides on in the right place. Um, when sometimes there's moments when you feel that you can't find that moment. We all get there. You, the, your inner dialogue gets too big and you're kind of, I, I hate myself, I hate my life, I'm rubbish at my job, I can't do this, I can't do that, and it all takes over and you just kind of escalate all because you can't do one line of code or because you banged your head when you tied your shoelaces. You know, we, we've all been there. Um, and the thing that I like to do and I think is very powerful and pretty overrated, is music. I think that uh, music is so powerful that we don't, that we do take it for granted because when you're in a bad place and you listen to sad songs, 
you get sad with it and you kind of go, oh, they understand how I feel. They understand me and all this stuff. And then you listen to happy songs and you'll dance around all over the place. So when you wake up in the morning, how about putting on a happy song and starting your day in the right mood? And it's something that kind of gets you up, gets you pumping around. It's a good, quick way to just boost your energy. And you know, maybe we should just do it at three o'clock in the afternoon when everyone's feeling a little bit glum. I'm not sure. But it just, music's a very good motivator, very good mood changer. And that's a very good place to start if you're lost. Um, music was very important to me when I was with my ex. It was very important to me going through everything. The first couple of things I did were go to a lot of gigs. Um, and, and that definitely did help a lot. Um, but I said this was a talk short, a short talk. And um, I want to finish today with one last message. And it pretty much is that it's okay. Um, it doesn't matter if you feel bad. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're not in control. It will be okay. Like, life will come along and it will sideswipe you and you won't know it's coming. It will come and knock you for six without you even realizing that, that it was happening. You could be on the top of the world one minute and fall down to the bottom the next. But you will get back up. And I think even whatever kind of space you're in and however you feel, you just have to keep remembering that it's okay. Something will help you. Your tribe will be there. You will take five minutes to look after yourself and you will feel that little bit better. Um, and if you can't find anybody, then come and talk to me and I'll have a chinwag with you for 15 minutes and we'll put the world to right or get a drink or do something because we're all here for each other and this is the wonderful thing about Drupal that it isn't just the code and yeah, it's all okay. never normally question. It's a bit weird, but <laughs> are there any questions? <laughs> What's your favourite colour? Pink. <laughs> <laughs>